Welcome to the Daily Dispatch. First up, we're looking into a major investment in the U.S. semiconductor manufacturing industry and how that fares for the Biden administration's aspiration of localizing the manufacturing. Then we're covering a major drought gripping the Horn of Africa and how it's leading to thousands of Somalis migrating to Kenya. And finally, we're spotlighting the UN's call to action for helping the stranded Rohingya community, an ethnic minority from Myanmar that continues to face persecution. We're here to give you news and to help you infer the world around you. I'm Tayyaba Nassar Khan, and here is your Daily Dispatch. To kick off the dispatch, let's take you to the world of technology, where a Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company, the TSMC, says it will more than triple its investment in the U.S. From U.S. $12 billion to $40 billion, the TSMC is the world's largest chip maker and is establishing a production hub in Phoenix, Arizona. In its initial stage, the production hub will make semiconductors, also referred to as the brains of electronics, for the Apple iPhones. Later on, the production hub aims to work on more advanced technologies, like future smartphones, artificial intelligence technologies, as well as car companies. This makes it one of the biggest foreign investments in the U.S. manufacturing industry in recent history. And it comes at a time when the Biden administration is pushing to expand the production of key components in everything, from phones to military aircrafts, locally to mitigate the supply chain disruptions that have been magnified post-COVID. In August 2022, the U.S. President Joe Biden signed a law, Chips and Science Act, committing $280 billion to tech and scientific research to increase the U.S. production of semiconductors, which stands at 10% of the global supply for now. In comparison, East Asia supplies 75% of the world's semiconductor chips. The U.S. is hoping that investments like the production hub being set up by the TSMC will bridge this gap in the coming years. This investment is also being seen in the context of the larger geopolitical tensions between the United States and China over many issues like Taiwan, the South China Sea, and most importantly, over the U.S.'s fear of dependence on the other countries, including China, for the key components like semiconductors that will be the backbone of industries of the future. Some experts say this chip investment will open up a new front between U.S.-China relations, which have been marked by great powers, strategic and economic contestation. For our next dispatch, we're going to take you to Africa, where thousands of Somalis are fleeing their homes in search of food and water in the neighboring state of Kenya. Drought, conflict, and the rising cost of living in the Horn of Africa are creating unprecedented food insecurity, with the looming famine forcing thousands of people to leave their homes and migrate. Due to four failed rainy seasons, some African nations like Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia are suffering the worst drought ever in 40 years. According to the UN's Office of Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs, more than 36 million people are affected, including 7.8 million in Somalia. Now, experts attribute such extreme weather events to climate change. And to make matters worse, this drought has come at the same time as a global hike in the fuel and food prices. According to the UNHCR, in the last two years alone, 80,000 people from Somalia have migrated into Kenya. And currently, over a million people are internally displaced in Somalia due to the extreme weather events coinciding with the violent conflict. Among them, 300,000 people face famine-like conditions. And if urgent support is not extended by the international community and organizations, mortality rate during the drought could be as high as 260,000. Now, poor and developing countries are bearing the brunt of climate change-induced disasters and extreme weather events, such as floods, famine, fires, and droughts, despite contributing little to the greenhouse gas emissions. The case of Somalia could be a deadly prophecy of the things to come unless the global community meets the climate responsibilities. With millions of people forced to migrate, stunted economic growth, and exacerbated social and political conflicts becoming the norm for the poorer countries of the world. And for our final headline, we'll talk about a refugee community that has evaporated from the global attention. The United Nations Refugee Agency has urged the Southeast Asian states to rescue 200 Rohingya refugees that are stranded on a boat in the Andaman Sea. 
Now, according to the UNHCR, the engines of the boat stopped working on December 1st, now more than a week ago, and there are fears that some on board have already died due to lack of food and water. The Rohingya refugees make these risky and unsafe boat journeys from Myanmar and Bangladesh to escape persecution. These journeys have seen a significant rise this year, with close to 2,000 people traveling by sea from January to November 2022. Now, this year's figure was just 287. Now, the Rohingya are an ethnic minority group in Myanmar, the majority of them being Muslims. Although they have been living in Myanmar for centuries, they're recognized neither as an ethnic group nor as citizens, and they were denied state citizenship in 1982, rendering them stateless. They were also excluded from the 2014 census. Now, Myanmar claims Rohingya are refugees from Bangladesh and India, brought to Rakhine during the British colonial rule and that they do not belong to a separate ethnic group. They live in squalid camps in the western coastal town of Rakhine and are not allowed to leave without permission from the government and also face severe restrictions on the basic services like health and education. Amnesty International has called the system an apartheid. In 2017, they were subject to a military crackdown after Myanmar security officials blamed Rohingya militant groups for killing the border security forces. Now, the military operation made 0.7 million Rohingya flee to the neighboring Bangladesh. It is now a subject of a genocide trial in the International Court of Justice. While the media attention on the Rohingya issue has considerably reduced, their persecution continues, making them risk their lives in unseaworthy boats in search of a dignified life. Also on the dispatch, here's a brief summary of other major developments from across the world. In a first since 1970s, the New York Times is facing a major work stoppage, with almost 1,100 staff walking out on a strike of 24 hours, as they demand better wages and remote work. With the U.S. market currently struggling with rising cost of living and labor tensions in the aftermath of the pandemic, employees stated that they were fed up of bargaining that has dragged on since their last contract expired in March 2021. The New York Times had earlier offered to raise the wages by 5.5%, while the union is demanding a 10% wage increase. Despite the negotiations continuing through Tuesday and Wednesday, the New York Times management and the union have failed to reach an agreement, with the workers staging a historic 24-hour strike on Thursday. Second, in a new development in Russia-U.S. relations, an exchange of the U.S. and Russian prisoners took place after the Biden administration proposed a swap in July. Basketball star Brittany Griner was exchanged for a Russian arms dealer, Victor Bout. Griner was imprisoned for allegedly carrying cannabis oil and had been in prison for 12 years, while Bout was convicted in 2012 for allegedly supplying weapons to the terrorist organizations. The swap exchange took place in Abu Dhabi. And finally, following up on yesterday's news from Peru, where President Pedro Castillo being impeached and later arrested after he unconstitutionally declared a temporary closure of the Congress. We're bringing you updates. Today, supporters of now former President Castillo clashed with the police in Lima over his arrest. The impeached president has also requested asylum in Mexico after he met with the Mexican ambassador while in detention. That's all, folks. We'll be back tomorrow with more bite-sized news that keeps you up to date with what's going on in the country, the region, and the globe. I'm Tayyab Anasar Khan, and this was your daily dispatch.